The agenda this week considered this province's plans for alcohol liberalization, heard from Ontario's former child and youth advocate, and spoke to MP Selena Caesar Chavan about leaving the federal Liberals. The agenda's week in review begins evaluating the state of the federal NDP. The last election was very difficult. Uh, then we sort of saw, you know, the love-in with, with Trudeau. I think that's completely gone. So we have an incredible opportunity in this election um, to show Canadians that there is a very bold vision from the NDP, that we have the leader who, and, and we have some great candidates who are seeking nomination or already the candidates. Mm. So I, I feel good. I'll be out there helping as well. Uh, you know, we, we speak plainly on this program, so let's do that right now. Jennifer, he's the first racialized leader of a major political party in Canadian history. That will be a problem in some parts of this country. How concerned are you about that? It matters, and it's also an opportunity. So many young people across the country can look to Jagmeet and see that they can be a part of politics. I remember as a young person growing up, I got into politics actually as a much music DJ when I was assigned to cover a federal election. And uh, we extended an invite, if you can believe it, half an hour on much music to all the party leaders and only two party leaders said yes. So no surprise, Jack Layton, the NDP, and a shout out to Jim Harris uh, and, and the Greens came on. Uh, we didn't hear from the Conservatives, we didn't hear from the Liberals. But I remember as a young person feeling that I wasn't represented. And this is as a young white woman, and there are white women in politics and there are white people in politics. So already there's a disconnect in terms of the issues, in terms of representation, in that plain language, how we talk about things. It is a game changer to see not just a racialized man, but a turban brown sick man out in the community, bringing the passion, the vision, and the leadership that is Jagmeet Singh. I think that's going to bring a lot of people into the party. And we saw that with this leadership race. We see new people mm -hmm. as members of the party. And we see new candidates coming in. Uh, because you can't just talk about diversity. You can't just talk about growing the base. <clears throat> you have to be it. Well, you're one of those new candidates who's now seeking a nomination. If he weren't the leader of the party, would you be as interested in seeking that nomination? You know, I might not be. You know, I remember growing up, my mother always sat us down in front of the television uh, whenever the CBC ad issue panel was happening, anything like that. And for the longest time, I looked, watched, and I thought, huh, politics is something that only white men do. You know, that's, that's what I, my takeaway was. A few years later, I thought, oh, okay, white women also do politics as well. <laughs> never thought about myself. You know, growing up as a low-income kid in downtown Toronto, never saw myself as part of these conversations. So I think it's a really, as Jennifer says, it's a really significant moment in time where lots of folks across the country are able to look at a party leader and see someone that not only reflects um, perhaps the tone of their skin, but also some of their lived experiences uh, with the darker skin. So I think that's really exciting. I'm also really excited when I have conversations with other folks that are inspired to run across the country. These are people who, for the first time, many of them are saying, you know, this is a party that does reflect our values that we can get involved in, that we can push and really be a meaningful part of. And I think a lot of that is down to uh, a really inspiring leadership. Cameron, having said that, you know, money talks in politics, and at the moment, the money's not coming in. Uh, why not? I think there are a number of issues on that front. I think some of it's, uh, some of it's a, a hangover from what happened towards the end of the, the previous leadership of the party. That, that did leave, obviously, a, a dearth of money in the bank, but also, frankly, we lost a lot of good people. A lot of good people went elsewhere. When we, when we lost official opposition status, we lost a lot of good people who decided to go do who either lost their job or had to go do other things, and I don't think we've ever quite come back from that whole experience. Um, to me, that was one of the reasons why I supported Jagmeet was his ability to organize. And when I saw him signing up so many people, I know when I was helping run uh, Pat Stoker's campaign at the very start, the number we had in our head to be able to sign up to new members, be able to win, was was about fifty thousand. And Jagmeet got just under fifty thousand votes. That's what and that's what his team did. And to their credit. And to me, I was always, I was of the belief, okay, if you can organize like that here, that can translate over to the party side. And unfortunately, it just hasn't happened yet. And, and uh, for, for various reasons, some things have gotten in the way, uh, um, issues have gotten in the way, but it still doesn't change the fact where we are where we are. And it does leave us behind the eight ball right now going into the campaign, and that does leave me worried. Let's follow up on consumer choice. Sure. Is is availability of supply really a problem in the province of Ontario today? I think so, uh, based on the fact that polling has indicated that the majority of um, Ontarians do want to see 
um, a challenge to the near monopoly of the LCBO and the beer store. It's true, we're not like Quebec. Right. We, you, can't, <laughs> you can't go buy beer or wine or spirits at your local dépanneur as you can in Quebec. Some people think that's actually an advantage in Ontario. You don't think so? I don't think so, and I think it actually hurts poor people more than we realize. If you think about it, if you have a, a high income, you can go to the LCBO or the beer store and buy a large quantity of alcohol at a one time, and you don't have to go and wait in lines very often. But if you're of a lower socioeconomic status, the inconvenience caused by the LCBO and the beer store hurt you more because you have to make more frequent trips. The province of Ontario the finance minister in particular, Vic Fideli, often makes the point that there are thousands upon thousands and thousands more availability opportunities in Quebec than there are in Ontario, and he's trying to do something about that. What's your view? Well, I feel it's the, there's this myth that, oh, we should be like other jurisdictions, Quebec, Alberta, where they privatize, they've made it easy access. But in fact, when you look at the data in terms of health harms, it's very troubling because they do have very high rates of consumption. They have high rates of hospitalization. So great, you're getting access. But on the other hand, what's not apparent often to our communities is what that means in terms of the health harms. So. For most people, they don't have an issue with alcohol, but if we have over 20% of Ontarians that have problematic use of alcohol, then we need to talk about that and we need to address that. And we know from research that the more you make alcohol available, the more people consume it, the more they consume, then the more harms. Jordan, do we have an availability problem in Ontario? Well, I'm going to take an unpopular tack with my craft beer audience and suggest that we probably don't have an availability problem. Mm. I think that Two hours worth of planning has never really caused me any problems in acquiring beer. Um, thinking ahead a little bit does wonders. What we might have is a retail opportunity problem. We have something like 360 brewing entities in the province, and not a lot of them have shelf space. So mm -hmm. access to market for the companies involved is a real problem. Access to alcohol for the public is probably not. Matt, is it really the case that if you offer people many, many, many more locations from which to purchase alcohol, alcohol sales will go up. So I, I don't have any hard stats on that, but sort of take on Jordan's point of, of the, um, you know, we have so many breweries and cideries and now one meadery um, in Ontario, um, and that's just going to continue to grow. But I don't think that putting, you know, beer in convenience stores is actually going to give those, the majority of those producers any more access to market because what we're seeing is it's a logistics issue. I, as a small producer, can only have so many drivers or hire third, so many third-party companies, can only afford to have so many salespeople in the, in the road or on the road. If I have 1,000 new customers or 1,000 new potential customers through convenience stores, I, I can't keep up with that. The big guys can keep up with that, the Molsons, um, the Anheuser-Busch InBev. So all you're going to do is open up more shelf space for Budweiser and Coors Light. Mm -hmm. And the small guys, unless you have a convenience store owner who decides, I'm going to open a boutique or I'm going to focus on these really rare availability uh, bottles and, and cans and products, which could happen. There's some great depreneurs in, in Montreal that are very focused on bringing the really good stuff. But the vast majority of the stuff you find in a depreneur is Boreal or, you know, um, or mass, mass market loggers. So I don't know that having convenience stores is going to help mm -hmm. someone like our company or a small brewery or a small cidery really get any more access to the market. Heather, let me follow up with you on that. If, if you offer alcohol for sale at many thousands more locations in the future than you do today, does that necessarily mean you will sell more alcohol? The evidence on this is pretty mixed. Um, I've seen things suggesting that that's the case. I've seen things mm -hmm. suggesting the opposite. Uh, there is uh, a study that looked at Virginia and uh, West Virginia, sorry, in Iowa's experience, and they actually found that uh, there was a reduction in per capita alcohol uh, consumption, and that was because people bought um, less booze when they were making more uh, frequent trips, hmm. uh, which encouraged them not to drink as much at home. So, um, of course, the, these questions are difficult to answer from um, an economics perspective, just because uh, culture and a lot of other um, confounding variables really do impact people's alcohol consumption. Um, so for instance, we see in Europe where alcohol is a lot more available, um, way more accessible, for instance, in Italy, and their rate of uh, problem drinking is 6.2%, uh, and in Canada, uh, it's 23% of people have had a heavy drinking episode in the last 
uh, 30 days and, and, and it's, alcohol is way more accessible in Italy than it is in Canada. <laughs> With everything that's been going on with the SNC-Lavalin uh, scandal, uh, you sent out a tweet a while ago directed at the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and it got a lot of attention. So yes. at the beginning, I'm going to quote uh, the Prime Minister, but this is what you wrote in the tweet. Yes. His quote, uh, it says, I believe real, real leadership is about listening, learning, and compassion. Central to my leadership is fostering an environment where my ministers, caucus, and staff feel comfortable coming to me when they have concerns, end quote. And then you add, I did come to you recently twice remember your reactions. Um, I'm inferring that you were referring to two exchanges you had with the Prime Minister. Absolutely. Um, where you were telling him you weren't going to run in the next election. Mm -hmm. um, and you said in both instances that he, wa he got hostile. Mm -hmm. How was he hostile? So I want to add to that quote. So his quote talked about his leadership and his open environment. And then the next sentence said, and Miss w R Wilson Rainbow did not come to me. That perception that he gave to Canadians was not my reality. My reality was when I phoned him, when I, I spoke to him on the phone, there was yelling. Mm -hmm. And I reciprocated that. I'm, I'm going to own that. You start yelling at me, I'm going to push back. The area where I think, and, and, and that was the yelling part. So then, then we, we had another meeting, a, a broader meeting, and without disclosing caucus confidentiality, we're talking about trust and building our team and doing what we needed for the greater good of Canadians. And throughout that meeting, I felt really terrible about the exchange that we had. So I wanted to reconcile and say, look, mm -hmm. you know, the meeting that we had wasn't the greatest and, um, you know, let's try to bury the hatchet. And that was met with even more hostility. Mm -hmm. It was the glare. It was the, it was the sort of, you know, stomping off. And then I, I realized that when he was talking about trust and team and the greater good, he was not referring to me. I need to push back on that because yes. you were once his parliamentary secretary. Absolutely. Um, he is the prime minister. Mm -hmm. Isn't he allowed to be angry when he hears that a member of his team is leaving? Of course, but ask any other member of his team who told him that he was leaving, which I did, mm -hmm. and you can feel free to do that. Ask them what their reaction was. Some of them said the easiest part of my decision was going to talk to the prime minister. Uh, the prime minister completely understood that I was leaving. It was a, it was a great decision and a great discussion. But, but maybe another, um, another way of looking at it mm -hmm. is if he didn't show any emotion and he was like, okay. No, would that, that wasn't, would, that But was not would it. that not be as bad if he was just to be like, okay, see you later? Then like, what was he apologizing for? Then why did he do that? And why did he do that in a way that didn't even bother to call me out of the chamber, but sat, stood behind me or stooped behind me in my chair and said, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry for how I treated you. Do you apologize to someone by stooping behind them or do you what? look them in the eye? We told Lisa McLeod's office you'd be coming on the program tonight and asked if uh, she had any comment about it, and we got this back via email. When I was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2003, I was in favour of an independent office to investigate and advocate on behalf of Ontario's children. However, after taking office and reviewing the past 10 years of subpar work product from the Ontario Child really? Advocate's Office that did little to inform government policy, it became clear to me that advocacy for Ontario's children should be the responsibility of government decision makers. We look forward to improving outcomes for Ontario's children and have the utmost confidence in Ontario's ombudsman to investigate any wrongdoing involving kids in care. The ombudsman, of course, now being responsible for the work you used to do. What do you make of that uh, response? At some level, it makes you want to say what, whatever, right? It's not about... I mean, it's obvious. I just mentioned that I received a letter from the minister the day before she, that announcement was made talking about the great respect she had for her office and with a little personal note. Uh, it's in the bulk of the letter too, but so whatever. Uh, it's not about that. It's about children. It's about what they need. It's about saying to children in this province, we will protect you. It's about saying to children in this province, you will have whatever you need to reach your full potential, every child. It's about saying to families, whatever kind of family we're talking about, however they're constituted, we say to families, thank you. You will have what you need to do right by your children. Uh, that's what this discussion should be about. If she had any issues with the work of our office, 
She hired me 10 years ago. She was on the hiring committee. She voted for the establishment of her office. She reappointed me, voted to reappoint me five years after for my second term. And she had nothing but praise uh, when I did meet her when she was in government. So when she releases a statement saying, you've been doing subpar work for 10 years, yeah. what do you think of that? Well, I'd say, where was she? Do you think right. this is her talking, or is this maybe something from the Premier's office? Uh, you know, I, I this whole situation has been hard to understand uh, for young people, children, people in the system, the public, I think. So I've, I've stopped trying to think think it through and figure it out. I think that's, there's a lot of things about um, some of the decisions this government is making. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a saying, form follows function. It means, you know, you, you think about the function, what do you want to achieve, and then you create a way of doing it. There's a lot of form this government is doing, building things, but not a lot of talk about function. So I don't know. I mean, in some ways, I think the hope is and, and we'll get to that maybe in this interview, but the hope is we'll move past and around this kind of words and, in, um, and work together sector after sector, service after service, in partnership with children to build a better province. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review for this Friday, May 17th, 2019. All of those conversations are available on our website, tvo.org, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, and on our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash The Agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.